again, and we're going to begin by singing. And we're going to sing a great old hymn that says, I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. It's $4.99 in the hymnal if you prefer to hold a hymnal and sing the alto part or the tenor part. Or otherwise, the words are on the screen, and so let's sing together. This hymn is different than most any other hymn that we sing for a reason. Does anybody know what that reason is? Has nothing to do with the theology of the song or of the words. It has to do with the music. Did you, did you notice that I directed the verse like this and then I directed the chorus like this? has a different time signature for the verse and for the chorus. The verse is written in 3-4 time. Now, 3-4 time means that there are three beats in a measure, and a quarter note gets one beat. 4-4 four, four time means there are four beats in a measure, and a quarter note gets one beat. And so the verse is written in 3-4 time, because there are only three beats in every measure. And the chorus is written in 4-4 four, four time because there are four beats in every measure. So when you leave church tonight and someone asks you, <laughs> let's pray. Father, we thank you for the words that we've just sung, for the opportunity to sing the wondrous story. 
Father, also we pray that You'll give us opportunities to tell that wondrous story. Because when we leave this place as the church gathered and we become the church scattered, we have many more opportunities to share that wondrous story. So help us to be bold in sharing. Help our lives to tell that story in every action and every word. Help us to make a difference. Help us to share Christ with our community. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's sing some more. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Holy is the name of the Lord. Glory to the name of the Lord. And finally, worthy is the name of the Lord. Let's sing.
Good evening, folks. It's good to see you here tonight. As we join together on Sunday nights, studying our way through the book of 1 Corinthians. And I must confess that for the last about 11 days, I have been seeing some of these places, but I haven't, I haven't been working really hard to be prepared for this night. So y'all forgive me for that. Uh, I mean, we were so busy in Europe and in Greece and 
We visited Ephesus in Turkey and saw a lot that was very interesting and taught us a lot of things. So I hope over time to be able to bring some of that information into the sharing of these nights together, especially as we're looking at Pauline pieces. We are working on 1 Corinthians. Paul was in Ephesus when he wrote this letter. So just a few days ago, I was walking through the old street of Ephesus. Fascinating. He wrote it to the people who were in Corinth. And just a few days ago, I was looking at the ruins of Corinth. So maybe that will play into stuff in certain ways. Since I have been gone and we had multiple Sundays that we didn't have Sunday night because of Mother's Day and because of the family life night that we had last Sunday or last, last Sunday. I was gone, but y'all were here. It's been a while since we were in this. You may recall that the last time in 1 Corinthians, we were in chapter 2, and we had been dealing with God's wisdom. Verses 6 down to about verse 9 is what we did the last Sunday that we were together. But since that's been so, so long ago, uh, with only a few words, kind of recapping that, tonight we want to move on into verses 10 through 13. <coughs> to see where verses 6 through 9 lead, but look back for just a moment, if you would, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6 through 9. Here's just a reminder for you. Paul said, Yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature. Wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away, but we speak God's wisdom in a mystery the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages of our glory, the wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood, for if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But just as it is written, things which eyes have not seen and ears has not heard and which has not yet entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love Him. And that's where we were the last time that we were together in 1 Corinthians. We have to say in verse 6 that the wisdom that is ours is not the wisdom of the world, but it is the wisdom of Christ. It is God's wisdom in verse 7. See, but we speak God's wisdom. We spent a fair amount of time the last time we were in these passages talking about what Paul meant by the word mystery. God's wisdom was in this mystery, and the mystery was not like the Hardy Boy series that I read when I was a kid, and many of you read Nancy Drew or the Hardy Boys, and there was always a mystery they were trying to solve. And So when you hear the word mystery, your mind might go in that kind of direction. And even though that's a little bit correct, the mystery that Paul is talking about, he uses that word to mean that which God didn't make clear in Old Testament times, but God has made clear now that God always has been moving history along toward Christ. It wasn't a last-minute thought. That was His always plan. And then as that mystery unfolded, God was intending that His people would now no longer just be the Jews, but we, the Jews and the Gentiles, the Messiah, Christ, has brought these people into the fold that was not known, but now it is known. So that's the mystery. It is this mystery. The mystery is the gospel that now all people are welcome through Christ Jesus. Oh, and then this is recap, y'all remember. The wisdom, none of the rulers of this age knew or understood this wisdom. Had they understood it, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord. But there is this wisdom of God. And now verse 9, which is where we ended last time. There's so much that our eyes haven't seen and our ears haven't heard. It has never been in our imagination even. The heart of man does not know this. God has prepared for those who love Him. And basically, he's starting that, that concept of wisdom. These things which I has not seen, the, the wisdom that I has not seen, the mystery which I has not seen, the ear hasn't heard it. All of these things God has prepared for those who love Him. I don't know if that's a serviceable recap or not, but there it is. He, all of this is thinking about the wisdom of God. 
And what I believe Paul is doing here, and I will read the new text here in just a moment, but Paul is about to explain to the Corinthian people a lot of stuff that they don't seem to understand. He's going to talk to them about how they live and how they worship and about the way they think about Jesus and a, a new understanding about resurrection a new understanding for these people who have not been even in a Jewish background about what righteousness and holiness, purity, what this looks like, the different ethics that, that we live now as Christians. He's going to explain a whole lot of stuff to them. And one of their responses might would be back to him, now wait a minute, how can you tell us all this stuff? How do you know all of these things? So he's kind of getting them prepared for a new slant. Yes, there's a lot of things you Corinthian people know, and with your background, you've got the wisdom of men, and you've got philosophical concepts. But all of that doesn't explain Jesus. I'm bringing you a different wisdom. And he's preparing them for the new wisdom that he's going to give to them. He spent quite a while in Corinth. He spent about a year and a half. But it seems like as though he was hardly gone before all kinds of new thoughts and ideas permeated themselves inside the body and new teachers came and they introduced them to different thoughts. And he had always the, the problem of the Judaizers, Judaizers who came behind him and tried to make them think that the Jewish concept of the Messiah and all of the law and all that needed still to be followed. And so he's got a lot of correcting to do. So he's, he's building a foundation from which he can say, here's the way you ought to think about that. And here's how I know. Here's how I know. That's a really important question. It's been a piece that we've talked about a little bit before. How do you know things? So hold on to that question as I read this text, and I'll come back and pick up that question again for a minute and then move into how Paul is going to explain the way he knows. He's bringing information to them, knowledge to them, and they might push back and say, wait a minute. How do you know all this stuff? Well, he's going to tell you how he knows all that stuff in the passage that we're dealing with today. So starting with verse 10, reading just the next four verses, 10, 11, 12, 13, this is the way it goes. For to us, God revealed them through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God. Which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. Well, like so often, you read a passage like that, it's hard to put an outline, it's hard to put, it's hard to trace an argument. Because Paul has all these words that he just throws in there. I've often talked about it like this, like he's had marbles in his mouth. You know, it's these spiritual words, God revealed them through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. Who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of a man? What in the world does all that mean? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the Spirit of God. And we've re spirit, not the Spirit of the world, the Spirit of God. Why couldn't, why couldn't you have been, you know, simpler? <laughs> but he wasn't. So that question comes. How do you, Paul, know these things? How do you know this wisdom that you're talking about you have? It's really an important philosophical question. When I was a seminary student many, many years ago, uh, the professor of systematic theology was William Hendricks. He is one of the smartest men I've ever met. He used to teach us every, every 
day we'd go in his class and he would talk basically over our heads. And we were trying to understand what he was saying. And I always thought, gosh, that guy knows so much. How did I get all this straight? And I wrote like crazy to try to get everything he said. And, and then one day he said, uh, do you have any questions that you'd like to ask? And <laughs> I couldn't ask that question. I, wasn't, I didn't know what he was saying to begin with. But there were a couple of students in there that were rather exceptional. And they asked questions that I really didn't understand. And then he answered in a way that nobody understood. It was so, it was so deep. It was so, I just kind of sat there and dropped my pen. I didn't want him help to write this stuff down. That guy's too smart. I don't know what he's saying. Well, he started out the whole semester by looking at four very important questions. And one of those questions, one of those questions was this really nice big word. The nice big word is epistemology. Look that one up, Doc. And even though it's a big word, it has a pretty simple meaning. The pretty simple meaning is, how do you know? How do you know? It's the study of knowledge. How do you know? And it's really not a question that typically you're going to ask yourself. You just common sense sort of things. I, I know this. I know, I know things. I, I read them. I heard them. I studied them. I learned them. Somebody that I trust told me about them in school. My teachers told me these things, and so these are the things that I know. I, I learned them at church or wherever it was. I, I learned these things. I heard these things. I put these things in my mind. I know these things because Mama told me, and Mama never said a lie. The hard thing about life is the older you get, the more you start finding out that some of the things that you heard and learned and were told weren't true. They, they weren't actual. There were a few things that Mom taught me that later on I looked at and thought, Mama, that's, that's, that's not true. I won't tell you very much about what that was because most of it was true, but there were bits and pieces, you know, some of the things I learned in school, I found out later on, oh, well, not all of that was true. But then once I started finding out that kind of stuff and finding out that some things were true and some things weren't true, then I, I thought all that was true, and now I find out that some of it wasn't. I had to start asking some really hard questions. Well, what is true and what is not true? Those are questions that have become really global in our era today as folks have started to say, well, you know, I hear what they say on the news, but I don't think that's true. Or I heard what they said on the news, and I don't think that's true. Well, those are true, and those are not true. And then everybody starts saying, well, I have my own truth. Your own truth? I don't know how that happens. I mean, truth is truth. You can't really, I don't think you can have your own truth, and your truth is different. There is a truth, or there is not a truth. And all of that kind of jumbled up stuff makes you have to ask that question, well, how do you in fact know something for sure? It's almost an easy question with a really, really hard answer. And I don't have an exact simple little answer for you tonight, but I do have Paul's answer for how he was going to say to the Corinthian people, I know the truth, and I'm going to tell you the truth, and you can trust what I have to say, and I'm going to tell you how I got there, how I got to the place where I know this truth. And you may say, Paul, I don't believe that, and I'm going to reject what you had to say, but you'll at least have to understand how he came to the conclusion as to why he thought this was the truth and why he thought he could speak it with authority and say, this is what you need to know because this is true and this is where I got it. So if you're not lost yet in what I've had to say, let's take a look at how Paul thought he came to know the truth. And it's not a simple little line of argument here, but I think you can follow it if you just hang in there with me for a little bit. As he has just said in verse 9, Oh, there are things that the, high, the eyes haven't seen, the ears haven't heard, it hasn't even gone into the heart of man, what God has prepared for those who love Him. And now verse 10, for to us God revealed them. Now I'm reading from the New American Standard Version. 
and I'm sorry, I haven't checked the King James to see exactly how the wording is or some of the other versions, so I'll just have to basically deal with the English text that I have tonight. For to us, God revealed them. And if you were reading the New American Standard Version, you would see that the word them is in italics, which means the translators have supplied that word. It's not actually in the Greek, but it's you've got to have some way for it to make sense in English, and this is the way they made sense of it. For to us, God revealed them through the Spirit. Revealed them what? From verse 9. Things which the eye has not seen, nor the ear has heard, and which has not entered into the heart of man. The, the word them, which is supplied in English, is referring back to verse 9, to the word things. For to us God revealed these things, these things which the eye has not seen, or the ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man. For to us God has revealed them through the Spirit. So the things that Paul was alluding to that you really haven't understood fully, that I haven't really understood fully, that the Corinthians really hadn't understood fully, that not yet had their eye or their ear or their heart been able to capture this thing. These things that Paul is referring to, where did Paul learn them? Where did they come from? Well, God revealed them through the Spirit. Now, if you've got wording that's pretty close to that, <clears throat> which I think you probably do, the word spirit is in the capital, is it not? In your versions, does it have a big S there, capital S? Well, now, you've heard me say this before, but at that time, when they wrote out their Greek, all the letters were capital. The little letters didn't come in for a couple of more centuries after this. It was all in capital letters. And I've even told you before that in those original Greek manuscripts, they had no separation between the words. When we were just now in Ephesus and in Corinth and we saw the ruins, we saw places where people had made inscriptions. Here was a, some kind of temple or something, and there's a big piece of marble, and it had words cut into it. And those words were all capital letters, and there was no separation between the words. It just went on and on and on. I couldn't read them. I could say, oh, those are all capital letters. So that your Bible has a capital S and not a little s, again, is the translators who are helping us to understand what it's talking about. The word for spirit in Greek is pneuma, P-N-E-U-M-A. Our English word like pneumatic, tire, that's a tire with air in it, or pneumonia, that's a lung that's infected comes from that Greek word, pneuma. And it can be translated spirit, or it can be translated wind, or a couple of other things. That's the word that's here. It, the same word is used to talk about the human spirit or the Holy Spirit. In this case, where it has a capital S, the translators thought it meant Holy Spirit, and so do I, and so do you. When you read it, it just makes sense that, that way. For to us, God revealed them through the Spirit, Spirit. What, what spirit? The Holy Spirit. God's Spirit. Okay, God has revealed this through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. Now that's a strange statement. I'm not sure I can completely clarify the thing. But the second time the word Spirit shows up, again it has a capital S. So it's referring to the Holy Spirit again. He says, it is the Spirit, the Holy Spirit which searches all things. Well, I guess one of the functions of the Spirit of God is that He searches, searches all things. I don't know exactly what all things mean, but it's the last phrase that's kind of powerful and interesting. This Holy Spirit of God searches all things, whatever that means, even the depth of God. I don't... I, maybe that doesn't strike you as a strange thing, but it does me. For we know, we know God in our Trinitarian way. The affirmation, the basic affirmation of Judaism as well as Christianity is this really great statement that there is only one God. There are not lots of gods. In the place that we have just been, they had lots of gods that they worshipped. 
we climbed up on top of the Acropolis in Athens, and there was the Parthenon. Athena, they worshipped the god Athena. Uh, and they had lots of temples to lots of other gods, lots and lots and lots of gods. Christianity came along and drawing from its Judaism said, no, all that's false. There is just one God. There is just one God. We know that's true. We affirm that all the time. One God, one God. There's not multiplicity of God. There's only one God. But we always throw the curveball in there as Christians and say, but God has revealed Himself in a Trinitarian fashion so that there's God the Father and God the Son and God the Spirit. And from there on out, you have a hard time, as do I and as do everybody else, trying to find some way to explain that. How do you have one God, but we know Him as Father and Son and Spirit? And it, we will attack this problem a million times in our time together, and we'll never get to a resolution. We'll find lots of ways to talk about it, and maybe some pictures that we can throw out from time to time. But there's always these little phrases that just make you scratch your head. The Holy Spirit is God. He is not some part of God. He is not some other God. The Holy Spirit is God. And here we find out that something that the Holy Spirit, who is God, does is He searches the depth of God. Wait a minute. I, I'm sorry, I can't explain it to you. The word depth, our word, like you've heard of bathysphere, the bathysphere, that was a submarine that went way, 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 way down deep under the ocean. Well, that little word bath means depth. That's the word that's here when it says the depth of God, the bath of God, not like you're bathing yourself, but the one that goes way down there. The Spirit of God searches the deep things of God. Doesn't the Holy Spirit of God, who is God, already know who God is? Well, yeah, and yet, hmm. If you want to stay awake late at night sometime, just lay there in bed and try to meditate upon the person of God who is but one but has shown Himself as Father, Son, and Spirit. And He's not Father for a while and then He's Son for a while and then He's Spirit for a while. He's always Father, He's always Spirit, He's always Son, but He's always one. There is something about the complexity of God that... God in Himself can explore His own depth. Chase that one a while. I don't know what I meant there. I just tried to say what the Scripture said. The Spirit of God searches the deep things of God. Theologians talk to us about the fact that when the Bible says that God is love, it is giving us this magnificent view into the person of God. For Love is always a shared thing. If there was just me and there was nobody else in the whole wide world, just me, it would be hard for me to say, I love you. Because it's just me. Love is a... <laughs> or, <laughs> but they're usually looking in the mirror. And then they think it's two of us. I love you. That's narcissism, isn't it? <laughs> when the Bible tells us that God is love, it implies that God within the complexity of who He is is exploring relationship even within Himself. Teacher told me that. I don't know what it means. Teacher told me that. He was right. The Spirit of God somehow searches the depth of God. God, God Himself <laughs> exploring His own character. If you had a view of God that was static, you know, God is just this straight line thing, probably this ought to shake that up a little bit. God is far grander and far more complex than you've ever thought. Somehow, that which is God, the Holy Spirit of God, searches the deep things of God. So there's a mystery enough, but now Paul is building an argument. It's the Spirit of God now here in verse 10. God has revealed them these things that the eye hasn't seen, the ear hasn't heard, and the, 
It hasn't even entered into the heart of man. God has revealed them through the Spirit. For the Spirit, you see, searches all things, even the depth of God. The Spirit of God is <laughs> seeking all the Godness, <laughs> learning it all, exploring God Himself. And now, a little kind of parentheses of explanation in verse 11. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man? Notice there's a small s now probably on that spirit in verse 11. The spirit of the man which is in him. That would have made a lot of sense to these Corinthian people who were very familiar with Greek, theo Greek philosophy. Those kind of ideas, the spirit of a human searches himself, knows the deep thoughts. They knew, they, uh, they knew philosophically that there was the, hu the physical aspect of the human, but they also knew philosophically that there was a spiritual aspect of the human. And you couldn't see the spiritual part, you could see the physical part. They thought the physical part was a little marred and a little broken, but the spiritual part was the great part, was the beautiful part, was the wonderful part, was the all-knowing part. The physical part would die and be gone. That's why they had trouble with resurrection. The spiritual part was eternal. And so when, they said, when, a, when a philosopher, a Greek philosopher, said something like verse 11, the spirit of the man, that's what knows all of the man. That would have made sense to them, as hard as that might make, not make sense to us. But just hold on to it. Just imagine that the spiritual aspect of who you are knows all that it means to be human, knows all that it means to be you. If you accepted that as truth, then you would accept the next phrase. Even so, the thoughts of God, no one knows except the Spirit of God. So Paul is building an argument He's going to help them know how he knows stuff. So the Spirit of God knows the deep things of God. Verse 11 would be, and this makes sense to you, he would say, because in your philosophical thoughts, you know that the spirit of the human knows the human. Well, if that part is true, then no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. They would have all been saying, yes, I guess that's true. That seems to make sense to me. The Holy Spirit of God knows God. Well, now, where is he going to go with this? Verse 12. Now, we have received not the Spirit of the world, little s again, not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit, big S, the Spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God. So I, I don't know if you followed each of the steps of this argument, but where he has ended up is saying, it is the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God that knows God. He knows the depth of God. This would make sense to you if you were a Greek philosopher. Yes, the Spirit of man knows man. Well, the Spirit of God knows God. So how do I know, Paul says, how do I know what I know now? It's because the Spirit of God, which knows God, has revealed these things. I haven't thought these up on my own I haven't sat in a room somewhere and just figured some stuff out I haven't come up with a grand scheme whereby I may convince you of some new thought this is from God verse 12 we have received not the spirit of the world but the spirit who is from God that spirit which has served has searched the deep things of God, that Spirit of God that knows all that God is about, it is that Holy Spirit that has now made these things clear. He says we, but I think he means me. <laughs> he does have a little crew with him. You know, he's got Timothy and he's got Silas and he's got some other helpers and Aquila and Priscilla and some other folks that are around. He's got people that are with him. So he says we, but I think he means me, I'm writing you these things. We have received, not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God. How do you know? How do you answer the epistemological question? 
How do you know? Well, Paul says, this is how I know. The Spirit of God that knows God has told me. I can't make that claim. I can go to the Bible and say, I think this is what the Bible's saying. Maybe the Holy Spirit of God will affirm for you, will speak into your heart and say, yes, this is true. But I can't say, oh, God has shown me these things, except from Scripture. Paul had Scripture. Now, he's going to be responsible for a whole lot of the New Testament. Not responsible in that he created it, but the Holy Spirit of God inspired him to write these things, of course. He had the Old Testament, and he knew the Old Testament, and he studied the Old Testament, and his thoughts sprang from the Old Testament. So, so he had that. He didn't have the New Testament. He helped supply that for us. And so when you and I are going to know the thoughts of God, for the most part, we're going to get it from Scripture. I'm going to be very leery of the person that comes to me and says, you know, last night I was laying in my bed and the Holy Spirit told me this. Now I'm going to tell you what the Holy Spirit told me. I'm going to say, well, go ahead and tell me. And then I'm going to cross my fingers behind my back and say, but I'm not going to listen very carefully. No, not really. I am going to listen. But I, the Holy Spirit of God still prompts us and still speaks to us and still helps us to know. But the Holy Spirit of God is not going to lead you into some kind of revelation that's different from the Scripture. You're going to have the Scripture, which is God's Word to us. The Holy Spirit of God is going to help you know how this is true. And, like an old theology professor told me, the Scripture is always going to kind of look over the Holy Spirit's shoulder. <laughs> Not that the Holy Spirit needs somebody to look over his shoulder. But what, this pastor, what the teacher meant by that was the Word of God, the Bible gives me what I need to know. The Spirit helps me to understand it. This, the Word of God, the Bible, helps me make sure that I haven't misunderstood what the Spirit confirmed for me. So the Bible, as the Spirit makes clear, as the Bible keeps check on your understanding of the Spirit, helps you to know where the truth is. So Paul had the Old Testament, and that helped him to know. But he had a new kind of understanding that came from the Holy Spirit of God that prompted him and made clear to him and explained to him so that now we have these words of Paul as the major interpreter of the life and the work of Jesus. The Holy Spirit led him there. He had the Old Testament to help guide him, but there was something new and fresh that was coming. Not different from Jesus, but new and fresh and an understanding that I can't do, but Paul did. And that was why. How did Paul know these things? The Holy Spirit of God, which serps the deep things of God, has now made this clear. That's what he says in verse 12. We have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God. Which things, verse 13, we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, now he's going back to the wisdom thought again, but in those taught by the Spirit, big S, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. He's laying the foundation again for what he's going to tell you and uh, them and us in all rest of the book of Corinthians. He's learned these things from God. Now I'm going to tell you is what he's doing so that you may know. I'm jumping ahead just a hair, but if you would, in my Bible, I've got to flip the page. It may be in the same, just down to the end of this chapter, verse 16. I'll have to come back to this when I deal with the verses after 13 down to here, but this is where he ends up. All of the kind of mumble jumble that I've just tried to work my way through to help you see the steps of the argument, this is where he ends in verse 16. For who has known the mind of the Lord? What a question. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Anybody who flippantly says, well, I know the mind of the Lord. Well, watch their behavior. <laughs> that will help you to know if they really did. Who knows the mind of the Lord? That He will instruct him. That this person who knows can maybe instruct the Lord. <laughs> but now the last phrase, the last phrase in verse 16. 
but we have the mind of Christ. What a statement is that? Pretty bold on behalf of Paul to say something like that. And yet, I think he was right. That somehow when he wrote, when he guided these churches, it wasn't just Paul. And you believe this too, or you wouldn't study the Scripture so seriously. It wasn't just Paul who had thoughts that tried to guide these churches and guide the church for 2,000 years. Paul, who felt the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God to write these things, wrote not just because he was a wise man or understood lots of stuff. Somehow or another, Paul relates to us the very mind of Christ. That's why you want to know the Bible. Because it's going to bring you into touch with God's thinking. Amazing. I've just finished, well, that's not quite true. I have a little bit left of a book entitled Paul. Hard title. By N.T. Wright, who was a professor at Oxford. He is now maybe in Glasgow. I'm not exactly sure where he is now. He is a leading New Testament professor in, in the world today. It's an interesting book. The approach of N.T. Wright into Paul's life was to read all of his letters, and as he read his letters and looked at the way Paul's life was played out, N.T. Wright tries to help his readers understand why Paul thought the way he thought. What N.T. Wright has tried to do is to get into the mind of Paul. Not an easy thing to do. I've lived with this woman for 40 some odd years. And every once in a while she still surprises me. I, she's lived with me for the same number of years. And every once in a while I surprise her too. It's kind of like, a, it's like, I thought I knew you. Where did that come from? You haven't ever had anything like that with the person you live with, have you? I thought I knew you. I, I never saw that. Well, those things maybe are getting less and less. It seems like after all these years, I kind of understand a little bit inside of her mind, not just her actions, but why she thinks the way she thinks. But then things come along to say, no, you didn't understand her at all. Oh, I have several movies that are in my mind, but I better not talk about them. <laughs> she knows my mind. I don't know you at all. To know somebody else's mind is very hard to do. Very hard to get inside and to know why they think the way they think. It's hard with her, hard with me. Hard with Paul. So Paul makes a very, very bold statement here when he says, we have the mind of Christ. What, what would your life be like if you were able to think like Christ thought? To see people like Christ saw people? To have an insight into God like Christ had insight into God. I can tell you right now, I would be a very different person as much as I want to and try to and explore into if I had the mind of Christ. I would like to, maybe someday, a little more than now. You will help me get there. I'll help you get there to live into the very mind of Christ. So as these people read Paul's letter, hopefully they're going to say, man, that's hard. But that's what Christ thinks. So maybe we better bend into what Paul has written here. 
I think is a powerful argument. As we read these things, there are going to be times when you're going to say, I don't like that at all. Especially when he starts talking about women and men. and ooh, I don't like that at all. He was misogynist. You know, he didn't like women. Well, he had the mind of Christ. Now what are you going to do? <gasps> no. So, the lesson tonight is kind of preparing us for the lessons that are going to come. When we run into some stuff that's got some really hard ideas, hang on to the fact that he's speaking with the mind of Christ. That might change how readily you will be open to some really hard ideas. So, that's what I have to say. I'm going to go home and go to bed. Maybe after a Whataburger or a pizza or something. Thank you for being here. It's been a really good day. This morning was great. The kids, celebrating them. What a great achievement. We had some good committee meetings this afternoon, made some big, important decisions, things that are going to be good for our church. Look forward to sharing more of those things with you. Studying God's Word, delightful, delightful. Well, let's pray, and then we'll see you next time. Father God, I confess to you, Lord, that it's often I don't have your mind. <laughs> I didn't need to. You know that, don't you? Father, but I want it. We want it. We want to think like you think. Bend us, Lord, always to you. And when your word challenges us like it does and like it will, Lord, may I break on your word because I know your word will never break on me. Speak the truth to us, Lord, and may we live into that. Thank you for these dear brothers and sisters. As they go to their homes and go out into our community, may they live for Christ, is my prayer. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thank you, everybody.